good evening everyone good evening today we are having dr harsh kumar sachdev dr harsh kumar sachdev is having cumulative 37 plus year of hands on operation and marketing career with indian oil corporation a fortune 500 company and largest commercial oil company in india sir is former executive director regional service northern region of indian oil corporation marketing division leading large teams in area of finance hr logistic contract quality control health safety and environment information system branding and corporate communication maintenance and inspection for supporting five state offices headquartered at new delhi noida jaipur lucknow and chandigarh Each key area of specialization include retail marketing, operation management, institutional sales and business development, logistic and supply chain management, learning and development with industry academy interface, maintenance and inspection. I welcome you, sir. Thank you. Now, thank you. Thank you, sir. Please. Uh, good evening to. all the academicians and uh, the participants of this program which is on energy management for sustainability and i will cover oil and fuel as you know that i am from indian oil corporation and i have spent almost the entire life till now about entire life means post my education all through i have been in oil industry uh, handling various portfolios and in various capacities so i will cover oil and fuel and i will just give an overview because there is only 30 minute session so i will talk only the relevant part so that you can aware i mean you are aware that uh, what oil is so though most of the people know what oil is but there are few things which i feel that people generally do not know and it is my privilege and honor to be part of this program so i will try to make it as interesting as possible though it is in, in the evening time uh, can we uh, go to the next slide This is the outline which I prepared. Since it is a very short session, so I will cover only three topics. I will just cover then fuel. We'll understand as to what we mean by fuel retailing, and then we'll understand the supply chain management, the broader outlook we will cover. And as you can see, that there is a wide gap between the two portions. and the last portion of this slide the outline is the learning takeaways i will request this this gap has been kept very purposefully and intentionally the reason is that the learning takeaways i will not cover i will request all to project at least one learning takeaway from this session in the time i mean anything whatever we learn whatever time we spend i i, I am i mean uh, my target is that at least one learning takeaway should you should take home after attending the session so we'll go to the next slide now now i'll start from this dr abdul kalam had said that uh, if you want that certain positive actions should be taken for any business entity there should be positive thoughts and if you want that positive thoughts should come to your mind then there should be some dreams in your mind i mean you should dream so basically it is to dream big dream simple and dream valuable so that those thoughts can be generated and those thoughts can be converted into actions that is what he meant so i will just try to create those dreams in your mind based on my presentation though it will not be very big dream but it will be dream i can assure you that next slide and next slide is relating to vision because unless you have a vision those actions and those thoughts probably will not come through and chanakya had said that even blind person can have a vision but a person with the eyes probably may not have vision so we need to augment our vision capability and vision outlook so that we can dream big and we can convert those dreams into actions and before that we convert into thoughts because thoughts will get converted into actions as dr abdul kalam had said next now we are talking about energy sustainability there are four pillars of energy objectives for this country 
and these things have been said by whatever these four pillars have been said by our honorable prime minister in one of the uh, his address to oil industry and this is starts from energy security now what he meant by energy security or what i understand this, this is my presentation so i will convey my understanding my understanding from the energy security is that there can be many geopolitical uh, developments and those developments may affect the transportation of uh, oil into this country because everybody knows that 85 percent of our oil requirement we are dependent on imports there are hardly 12 13 14 15 percent even if i back out we i manage it out the alternate energy whatever we are producing or the fossil fuels we are producing in the country around 85 percent of the requirement we are importing so energy security means that if something happens globally and there is uncertainty on the movement of products from outside to this country we should have that energy security in terms of maybe inventory levels in terms of our alternate use in terms of alternate fuels available and what we are going to do about if there is something which has happened which happens maybe there is some war maybe some, there is some obstruction uncertain times do not come with the announcement they come i mean all of a sudden so we have to be ready with that kind of situation the energy security is first and foremost for the energy sustainability next is efficiency in energy use we have to be efficient whatever energy we are using whether it is cooking gas whether it is liquid fuels whether any electricity or any kind of energy we are using that has to be efficient number one and number two we have to use it fully and another concept which is coming through in today's scenario is energy efficiency is that circular economy probably you must have heard this term i do not know but circular economy is a new term which is coming up though it is a very old concept but coming new fresh in a new form so we will just discuss about it after this slide as to what i mean by circular economy the environment sustainability because fossil fuel as we know that the because of emissions and because of other things now uh, uh, we have seen that particularly in Delhi, the pollution levels and other cities, pollution levels very high. So energy sustainability has to be there so that we can live, we can live longer. Now, if pollution levels are going high, then what is happening to our next generation and what is happening to our own health, probably that is a question mark on this. So we cannot go on and on and on for using uh, fossil fuels. We cannot be dependent on this particular uh, type of energy. But we need this we cannot overlook also we cannot avoid using this fossil fuel also at this uh, present uh, age uh, maybe electric vehicles maybe alternate energy they are coming into the existence that is fine but as far as the indications are concerned as far as the predictions are concerned of people who are into this business probably fossil fuel is not going to go away at least for 20 25 years away i mean from now so environment sustainability, we have to look for means as to how we can uh, reduce emissions, how we can control our pollution level so that we can go longer and longer with this kind of scenario, energy availability as far as energy availability is concerned. Then affordable access of energy uh, for all. So affordable access means that it has to be made available to last mile to, to the last person of the country uh, in the last corner of the country and it has to be affordable by him by him or her uh, at that price price should not be very high though price is again it's a very common topic for discussion as far as petroleum products are concerned if somebody has any questions probably i will be glad to answer those questions but the idea is that affordable access has to be there for all the people of this country so that energy can be used not only for few but by others as well Next slide. Now, this is circular economy. Basic concept is with the reduce, reuse, and recycle. Like, for example, I'll give you uh, that cow dung we are using. Now, in this, although biogas digester, the example is given in the last paragraph, it is used in Kenya. Purposefully, I have put this. Actually, the concept is that cow dung is a very, very, I mean, uh, useless kind of thing in our day-to-day uh, -day activities 
but this cow dung can be converted into biogas by using this biogas digester and that biogas can be used for cooking purposes and the leftover is used as fertilizer so it becomes a cycle from cow dung we are converting a fertilizer fertilizer goes into the plants plants grow they give oxygen and the cooking gas whatever emissions are there those are getting absorbed by those plants so this is becomes a cycle or this becomes a rotational kind of thing and this is a circular economy there are plenty of examples in this i will probably cover in the next slide also the actually we know uh, particularly the western countries europe and america that use and throw policy that a product which can be used and thrown away but this concept actually the circular economy concept is just opposite of this this concept says that first you reduce the usage and then you reuse and then recycle another example i'll give you right here this plastic bottles we are using plastic bottles for water purposes water bottles now if we reuse those bottles actually i have personally done this in my office uh, around 3 years back that i saw that 1 uh, liter bottle or half liter bottle we were using plenty uh, and the monthly expense was around 60000 rupees on water itself because i was heading that uh, unit and in which around 600 people work 600 to 700 people work now 60000 was the expense on monthly basis for that plastic bottles so what i did was that i uh, bought bigger kind of dispensers and reduced the uh, water bottles and asked the people to reduce the usage number one number two now you reuse the, those bottles to fill it up again and use it again and those bottles which were not i mean which were not reusable those bottles were sold to an agency who is into the recycling part the plastic bottle got recycled made something else from that and then entire process was over and the expense monthly expense it came down to only 5000 rupees so that is what the basic principle of circular economy is and this is just as i said that uh, use and throw policy is just opposite to that there are two more examples probably i'll cover in this in the next slide Gamble Merchant is a company. It is in Denmark. What it does is that old bricks. Whenever there is a uh, raise and rebuild kind of a thing, that building is being uh, broken and all that, and the old bricks are coming out, they buy old bricks from there. They clean it, and uh, they collect and clean it, and then check if the, these are fully. I mean, they, they uh, for the purpose of recycling. they clean it and then use it for somewhere somewhere else for other some construction activity wherever it is going on they sell it and they have seen that 95% of energy can be saved on this and as an example they have done this that there is a hotel in denmark uh, which used around 3 lakh this kind of old bricks and which saved around 150 tons of co2 emissions which otherwise would have been come would have been produced had we not used these old bricks and produced new bricks using their technology and all that then probably 150 tons of cot would co2 would have been emitted so that is what they saved another agency is vika that is again in denmark what it does is that the uh, new products or the high value products they are selling it or they are issuing it to their subscribers on sharing and circulating purposes like for example chandan's clothes they are very high end clothes but offered at a very attractive prices to the subscribers they will give only 20 pieces of those clothes to one subscriber and when child grows becomes little taller and then those clothes are useless those clothes are again bought and then reused and given to somebody else to somebody else there is a technology intervention here because it is not that you reused clothes can be used by something else it is properly cleaned and sanitized and all those things all that process are getting over but the idea is that maximum usage of that particular product is being done before it is being thrown away so that is what the idea is of circular economy so this kind of circular economy we can implement implement anywhere and everywhere in our day to day activities we can think of as to what we can do uh, that instead of throwing away things can we reuse it so if that sense probably comes probably we can 
save a lot money, even CO2 emissions. Forget about money. Money in any case will be saved. But CO2 emissions probably will be able to reduce. Next. Now coming to oil scenario, oil scenario, I'm talking about 2018-19, this 213 billion tons, India has consumed this kind of petroleum products. Now, since it is the topic is oil and fuel, and we are talking about the fuel, fuel part, I will cover only liquid fuel at this point of time. Now out of this 213.2 million tons of petroleum products, which was consumed in 2018-19, now 28 million tons, 28.3 million tons, was petrol. Petrol is MS motor spirit and 83.5 million tons was used as HST. HST is high speed diesel. Normal we call it diesel and MS we normal we call it as petrol. Now MS plus HST because there are two types of vehicles if we leave out only CNG and auto LPG gas. There are two types of liquid fuels that is MS plus HST accounts for 52.4 percent of total petroleum product sales. So major portion is this only. Now, if we come to this kind of volume, now, if we see how much is sold by public sector companies and how much sold is by private sector companies, the public sector company, uh, the share out is around 78% on a day basis. And if we talk about petrol, that is MS, 94% is sold by PSUs, public sector oil companies, and 86% of HSD is sold by public sector, out of which 89% is sold by PSUs. So that is the kind of volumes we are uh, calculating here. Now, if we talk about vehicle population, assuming that the, there is no vehicle off the road, all the vehicles are on road, and just for a moment, we assume that there is no gas-based vehicle. There are on, around 25 crore vehicles which are running as on today, which are registered in, as a matter of fact, as on 1st of March, 2020. Now, if we consider the population of the country as 130 crores, now 130 crores and assuming that there are only five members of a family, it comes to around 26 crore families. Am I right? If somebody has any, any uh, question on this, so 26 crore families and 25 crores number of vehicles. Now, it is matching, the figure is matching, meaning thereby the quality or the oil it affects the entire population, all families. And if family is getting affected, that means every person is getting affected. So that is what the equation is. If oil is taken care of, probably all the families of this country, probably they are taken care of. So that is the importance of oil here. Next. Now, history of oil. If you ask any person, of oil industry. Probably he, he or she will start from the fact that in 1859, the first oil well was drilled by Colonel Drake in 1859 in Pennsylvania and USA. But the question probably asked is normally that from where Colonel Drake came to know that this is the oil well and oil is so precious and why did he drill that oil? from where he came to know the history of oil as to this oil can also be used and oil is so precious. He will know, know then only he will go for searching uh, oil. Now the history says that actually it is started in 1854. There was a professor, his name was Benjamin Silliman. Benjamin Silliman was a professor in Yale University in the USA. And those times the professors used to get very little salary and he was not able to carry on with his family expenses and all that. So he used to take outside research projects. So one day he received there were four or five guests. There were four or five businessmen who came to him with a bottle of black kind of liquid. And they wanted to know using his research that what it is and whether it can be used for some other purposes and especially for illumination and all that. Dr. Benjamin Silliman did the research and by the distillation process, probably he can uh, obtain a new product, which now we think that it is kerosene. And for using that illumination purposes, he was successful. He took about three months and after three months, he called those businessmen and said that this is a very, very important product of it. This can be used widely by all the people. 
and he had earlier said that his fees total will be around 5 to 26.08 dollars for doing this research now since he declared the result and those businessmen did not have that money of 526.08 dollars to pay him off so what they did they did not pay and they went the they went with the report and then they started searching as to where this uh, oil can be found out and that is how the first oil well was drilled in 1859 but later on they probably they paid to the Benjamin Silliman uh, this amount and then the transition was squared off. Now this is the history of oil. Actually it starts from 1854 not from 1859 as generally believed. Next. Now this is what uh, I already uh, narrated so we'll go to the next one. Now understanding petrol retailing. This petrol retailing is, uh, I mean, talking about the fuel. The retail in general terms is generally considered as unorganized because if you go to market, there are so many things organized, there are so many things unorganized. And if we search out on Google and every paper, probably every research paper will tell you that retailing is basically unorganized. I'm talking about this country or maybe developing countries. This is basically unorganized. But petroleum retailing is the most organized, even in the organized retail sector. And uh, these liquid fuels, the organized retail sector, these liquid fuels are delivered only at retail outlets, which are properly authorized. These retail outlets or these petrol pumps may be of any company, of any, I mean, Indian Oil, Bharat Petroleum, the Sun Petroleum, these are the public sector companies, then Reliance, then SR, uh, Shell, SR means Naira Energy now, Shell, these are the private companies or maybe one or two more companies which are, uh, delivering this kind of product because Assam Oil, yes, Assam Oil company is there and there are a few more companies in Assam. Now these retail uh, outlets, they also do other kind of business like there are convenience stores, there are restrooms, there are hotels at some of the retail outlets, there are some food shops. There are so many things which, are, which have come up recently. Now, idea is because in the, this scenario, in the current scenario, when people do not have time, so that all the facilities can be given at the same place to the, our customers. So that's the whole idea. And when we talk about fuels, I will be covering fuels means basically in terms of retail fuels. Now fuels can be other products as well, like furnace oil, like light diesel oil, like uh, there are so many ATF. ATF is aviation turbine fuel. There can be so many other products. But for the time being, I'm restricting myself only to these retail fuels, which are generally available for the common purpose of understanding. Probably in the next session, probably I'll cover the other products as well. Next. Now, this retailing of petroleum products, or maybe petroleum products, all petroleum products, this comes under downstream sector. There are three sectors, upstream sector, middle midstream sector, and the downstream sector. Upstream sector is basically refining. Our upstream sector is uh, exploration. Exploration where the crude is found, that is upstream sector. Midstream is transportation of that product, that crude. And downstream sector is basically refining, refining and marketing. So we, I mean, this, uh, what I'm talking about is the fuel basically that comes in a downstream sector and it involves basically refining. Refining takes place in a refinery using crude oil, whatever comes in the upstream sector, then it's transportation because refinery cannot be everywhere. Now in the entire country, in our country, there are 23 refineries. The country is uh, getting all petroleum product supplies only from these refineries or maybe some imports as well. Imports means directly from imports. So these are the things which are happening. And of course, marketing, there are retail outlets to market these products. So these involve refining, transportation and marketing. And what is crude? Crude is basically hydrocarbon, which has 84% of carbon basically, and up to 14% of hydrogen, and up to 3% of sulfur, and then mixture of oxygen, nitrogen, and other metal traces. There can be other products as well, which comes under the last percentage. Now, sulfur is very, very harmful. Now, crude can be sour, crude can be sweet. Sour means uh, if API is more than 20, it becomes sweet and API is less than 20, it becomes sour. So these are the specifications. Um, 
probably all, I will cover all these things in my next session. But today, for the time being, I'm restricting only to this level. Next. So what is the definition of, as you mentioned, ABI, right? 20%. Uh, American Petroleum Institute, something like that. Right, API. Uh, yes, American Petroleum Institute. Huh? Yes, yes, you're right, sir. Uh, American Petroleum Institute. That determines the gravity. Yes, next. Now, optimization planning is done. Actually, if you talk about the supply chain management, the supply chain management, it starts from beginning to end. And that is what we know about the supply chain management. Now, in our case, in this oil case, it should start from crude because crude is brought, then it is refined, then it is transported, then it is marketed. And till the last drop is delivered from a nozzle, that should cover the uh, entire supply chain management. But in our case, what happens is we start from demand forecast as to what is going to be the demand. The, the word I'm using optimization, I'm only explaining to that extent as to what is optimization. The demand starts, demand forecast, I mean, our supply chain management starts from demand forecast, okay, how much demand is going to be there. There can be variation and there will be variation in demand forecast and actual figures, but we know based on history, historical figures as to what is going to the difference. Then distribution planning. As there are 23 refineries. I'm talking about only 11 refineries. That's where the IOC is concerned. IOC has 11 out of 23. Now, from which part of the country requires which product? There can be variation, regional variation, or maybe state-wise state variations. So which product? Because if some state, they are into construction activity and road construction is going on heavily, then probably bitumen requirement is going to be more than others. But if there is no construction activity, then probably the middle districts like HST and kerosene, they are going to be more. It depends on the state to state and depends on the circumstances. So we are trying to decide as to which part of the country requires what product. Having done that, then refinery wise, because each state does not have any refinery. Now that is a region. Like for example, Mathura. Mathura is feeding entire north practically. And some product is also going to some other state as well as to West Bengal or goes, Bihar, although it goes. So what and where to make, how much will be produced in Patra, how much will be produced in Baroda, how much will be produced in Bangalore, you know, all those things are determined here. And then what kind of crude we require, because crude processing also takes I mean, different kind of different kind of technologies. Now each refinery is prepared to handle a different kind of crude or maybe a mix of each crude. And then it is known as complexity factor. Now, complexity, the complexity factor is more than that means different kind of crudes can be processed by that refinery. So depending upon the complexity factor, like Panipat refinery has a complexity factor of 15 and so is with Paradip refinery. So this complexity factor is decided and different kind of crude, whether it is sour or whether it is sweet, depending upon the requirement. Then crude evaluation and crude sourcing is done. Which country will give me what kind of crude because the crude coming from Saudi Arabia will be a different mix crude coming from other countries Venezuela it will be a different mix crude coming from I mean there are various countries there are various suppliers Russia it will be a different kind of thing so depending upon what is our requirement then we source our crude so that is what I'm trying to convey that optimization in the whole process is done by different models and those models are then put to place and that is done centrally at our corporate office as far as IOC is concerned. And based on those models, based on those numbers, that entire sourcing is being done. And that is how these activities are optimized. It's a complex process. I mean, consider okay, right from sourcing of crude to delivery from the uh, nozzle, the, there are so many processes that which are involved, but all those activities are being handled very efficiently and i'm sure you must not have heard that the scarcity of products i'm not denying that all the some pockets may still have some problems but on generalized basis the country went without petrol you must not have heard this so the entire process is done very efficiently and that total I mean, thing is that supply chain management is being managed very professionally and very diligently next 
Now, coming to liquid fuels, this uh, product MS and HG3, the retail fuels I'm talking about, a storage point, these are basically refineries, refining uh, points from refineries or the imports, because import will take place at a coastal area. It may or may not be a refinery point. The, either from those imports or from refineries, it moves to different locations. Like for example, if Panipat is producing a product, it may be going to some other storage point. Maybe Panipat itself is a storage point, then it, it may go to Jalandhar, it may go to some other area, so that from those points, it can be released. Now from Jalandhar, product is going to entire Punjab, to entire JNK, Ladakh, all those places are being fed from there. Likewise, from Mathura, it comes to Najibabad, and from Najibabad, it goes to the Western UP part, or it comes to Rudki, Rudki, it goes to up in the hills, in the Uttarakhand. So that is how it is being done. The transportation, now from the, those major points like Jalandhar and uh, Najibabad or Rudki, the transportation takes place only by road. It may go by rail, but rail, it goes to some other places to a small distribution center from where it goes by road. And then it goes to at actually at retail outlets by road only. So this is a method by which the requirement of petroleum products, liquid fuels I'm talking about, this is being met uh, in general. Next. So this is what I wanted to cover because I've just covered half an hour. So if we have to, uh, if anybody has any questions. So sir, this is Praveen Gupta. Yeah. Uh, Professor Nikhil, we can ask question now or you have yes, to sir. say something before? No, no, uh, it is, uh, session is open for the questions. Okay. So, sir, first of all, it was very nice uh, presentation and of course, your experience and uh, length of service speaks about it, the way you explained everything. So, so one of my, you know, question, which actually, because you have given a very broad perspective of the whole spectrum uh, about uh, uh, liquid or maybe fuel energy, uh, petroleum energy. So, you know, one of the basic question, not as an engineer, but comes to my mind as a more of a, uh, you know, in today's situation, one of the points which you talked about circle economy. Yeah, yeah, reduce, yeah. Reduce and this thing. Mm -hmm. Now I'm just thinking one or two generations back, mm -hmm. we as Indians, I'm so typically if I talk in Indian terms, mm -hmm. you know, we have been a very good circular economy. We used to use each and everything to the last core. You know, we never used to waste anything. Yes, yes, yes. But today's world, the world is after GDP, you know, they want to have higher GDP, use it, throw it so that you can increase, increase your consumption. So your GDP will grow. Mm -hmm. So in such a scenario, I'm saying, I'm just trying to think in my mind, mm -hmm. how, how a country like India, which has a root, strong roots of, uh, you know, mm -hmm. uh, saving and uh, using the things in the rightful manner. Mm -hmm. We'll get back to that, you know, because at one point of time, we have a very high ambitions to get into five trillion economy mm -hmm. at the same time. If you have to increase economy, it means you have to use more. Mm. What, right? So how you, I'm, I'm just, since you touched upon the point very nicely, I'm just thinking of taking this view from you. See, this kind of economy, circular economy, I'm talking about from the angle of sustainability. Now, unless we are able to sustain, after all, we are doing everything, all the business actions or whatever we are doing, it is only for living. If there is no living, then there is no point of any GDP or something like that. But at the same time, we cannot ignore GDP as well because we have to grow as a country. So we have to make a balance out of the two. Uh, it is not that longer use. Longer use in any case is there because you said that uh, we are following this from very old days and I said so when I started this. This is old concept, but now being developed and uh, being uh, introduced at other places as well. Basically, it is reduced. Reduce, reuse, and recycle. A particular activity which we are throwing away, that should not be thrown away. But usage, maybe as I gave you example of water bottles. Water bottles we can buy, still we are still buying. I'm not saying that we have eliminated usage of that, those bottles. But those bottles we are buying in lesser number. Water in any case we are buying in a bigger bottle. We are reusing those so that, and probably if we are talking about the GDP part, probably we'll have to make a balance out of the two. 
GDP should not be ignored, but how best we can make use of these actions or this circular economy, probably that will have to be seen. And I also gave you that example of cow dung. That we are producing, I mean, cooking process, cow dung is mostly is used for uh, as a fuel. Now, burning also takes place. We are producing biogas, we can produce biogas, and these are the systems which are existing in Kenya. There are, uh, I mean, prototypes are available in, uh, of this particular product. That digester converts that cow dung into biogas. We can use biogas for cooking, and the leftover is used as fertilizer. So these are the things which we need to keep in mind. We cannot totally focus on GDP at this point of time. Along with GDP, we have to see the sustainability as well. And along with sustainability, we have to see GDP as well. That will be probably my answer. Thank you, sir. Um, Mr. Satsev, uh, thank you for providing us a very informative uh, uh, insight into uh, into energy management and um, two things why what I wanted to talk one was uh, my name is by the way Anil Kaul yeah. and uh, I uh, wanted to share with you the takeaway which is the new term I've heard so um, whatever we do in circular economy is practiced since uh, ages in India Mm -hmm. But you've given it a perspective and uh, thank you for that. At least I've come to know of a new term, circular economy. I had not heard of it. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to go to two, two different things, uh, which is not uh, here in this lecture. One is that what is uh, IOC doing in terms of uh, research, in terms of uh, improving the engine efficiency, maybe uh, in terms of doing uh, something to cetane and octane values uh, mm -hmm. for uh, having better energy balance uh, within the internal combustion engines. Mm -hmm. Though it's not part of this, but sometime when you're having, a, maybe you can throw some light on this. And second thing was that we just wanted to understand what is the taxes, what we load on to the fuels uh, uh, when you have this big supply chain uh, right from getting the crude from abroad and to uh, the retailer who buys it from the retail pumps. Mm. So if you can you want me to throw answer. some light on If you can answer that, that'll be lovely. Okay. Engine efficiency you talked about regarding our R&D center. Now, yes, sir. India got independent in 1947 or even 10 years later. Nobody talked about, because all the foreign oil companies were exist in existence and they were operating. And Indian oil came into being in 1964 in this form what it is in today. Now, right from beginning, the work is going on in our R&D center on energy efficiency, engine efficiency, or maybe. Basically, developing engines is not part of Indian oil. The part is how best can be used, provided in an engine. Engine is if any, any specifications are there, how those specifications can be improved upon as a fuel or as a lubricant. R&D center started working right from the beginning and they produced different kinds of lubricating oils. And you will be surprised that maximum number of patents that IUC has probably it is world's record as far as lubrication is concerned. And we have beaten, and the IUC has beaten even mobile exxon and all those things in terms of quality so this is the efficiency work which is going on and it is it's still going on it, it has not stopped but producing an engine for more being a, more efficient that probably is not in the scope of indian oil we are only focusing on fuels or maybe on lubricating oils c10 and octane is a result of that as a fuel, 100 octane, you must have heard in the newspaper, you must have seen the newspaper, or maybe heard on TV, that recently on 1st of December, it was introduced in the city of Delhi. And the first car of our Honorable Prize President was refueled with this 100 octane product. So this is a result of that kind of research and that kind of initiative, which probably oil companies have taken. And you will also be surprised that 
we have six grades which are available today in the entire country. Probably IOC was the leader by introducing it in the NCT National Capital uh, Region of Delhi, National Capital Territory, and later NCR, National Capital Region of, of course, adjoining areas. In uh, it was in December, I mean, uh, 2018, and then 2019 and 2020, entire country, it has been introduced, all companies that in any case. Today. The energy balance, different kinds of energy balance. Now, IOC is the only company which started, though we are oil refining, marketing, and transportation company, we are a downstream company, and national company, I would say. IOC was the first company among all oil companies to have started the solar energy at our retail outlets. The dispensing unit, because there was a problem of power, particularly in up country locations. And in remote area, there used to be no power and there used to be, when you are not able to operate your unit, then how will you deliver the product to the customers? That used to be a problem in the, those days. In 2005 and later, IUC thought of providing the solar equipment at the retail outlet, at the unit itself, to operate that unit when power is not there. And today, probably nine megawatt power is produced by those solar uh, energy cells. I mean, combined, combined capacity is around nine megawatt. Nine megawatt is a good capacity as far as country is concerned. So this is the initiative which IOC had taken at that point of time and it is still continuing and probably all retail outlets probably will be powered with solar energy in the years to come. Now, as far as tax is concerned on fuel oil, those taxes broad, I will tell you broadly, it is import parity price. Now, the principle, general principle is that if a product, suppose we are sitting in Delhi, if a product is yeah. in Delhi, and if there is no refinery in the country and we'll have to import entire thing from outside, then how much it will cost? That import parity will not because 20% roughly 15% is available within the country. So 80-20 formula is followed. The 80% is the import, import cost and 20% is indigenous cost. So combining these two factors, then the final price is arrived at. General principle is that. Now, specifically, if you want to know what kind of taxes are loaded, probably that will be very difficult for me to, I mean, say in the sessions, because those are the things which are not really in our hands. It depends on many policies, many guidelines, many, many instructions. So, but still, if you insist, I will try to find out exact requirement, then probably I'll convey in the next session. But broadly, it is 80-20% formula, which is followed here in the country. Thank you, sir. Thank you for enlightening us. Any questions or anything is remaining? Sir, no, a question mera aapka uske par tha, jaha par aapne total uh, uh, requirement ke upar likha tha, country ka, 200 and something. 213 million tons. Can you, can you just take your slide to that, uh, Professor Saab? Can you take that to that slide? Third, third fourth slide. 213 million tons. Uh, I, I. So, this vehicle population likha hai, this and this summing up to 252 million, right? Uh, 25. This is in uh, millions, right? It, it, is in millions. It, is, it is in millions. So, 185 millions are two wheelers out, out of the 252 millions, which is roughly representing roughly around 60 65 percent. Approximately. 1.5 crores, yeah, out of 25, yes. So, sir, if we see it from a usage perspective, I'm sorry, this is the vehicle perspective. Uh, is it two wheelers also represents significantly in terms of uh, this consumption? Yes. So, which means uh, a major uh, drive on the two wheelers can significantly reduce the uh, uh, pollution also, you know, or fuel uses. If we are having like electric kind of thing, which is being talked about nowadays. It can significantly reduce the requirement from our oil dependency? No, actually all types of vehicles because emissions are different in different kind of engines. So that depends on what kind of, like if you're using old buses and old kind of things, probably emissions will be more harmful there. So if you are talking about emission, then probably we'll have to analyze. This is only in terms of the availability of registered vehicles. I'm only talking about registered vehicles. Okay. This figure is showing that. Now, this is not showing the emission levels by each sector. 
that will have to see it differently okay right that will have to be segmented differently ah that will have to be segmented okay thank you sir so uh, i'm from uh, automotive industry but uh, one of the uh, coming back to the circular economy uh, we had uh, our paint and paint sludge material we used to uh, uh, give it off to uh, cement kilns where the temperature goes as high as 20 more than 2500 uh, degrees c and we liquidate in them in the kilns so that uh, uh, we are saving the environment mm -hmm. just for uh, your knowledge mm -hmm. so what is the question no it's not a question i'm just sharing information okay okay, okay. Uh, the paint and paint sludge from automotive companies okay okay, okay. which is getting uh, which is uh, as treated or uh, classified as uh, hazardous waste mm -hmm. so what we do is we sell it to the cement kilns okay 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 so, so that, sir uh, we are saving the environment that, that's what i wanted to share just to uh, save our environment is circle this is a part of circular economy uh, not exactly but at least this is maybe part of the chain okay Okay. because you are anyway using cement uh, which is the uh, output of the cement kiln it gets used into the domestic usage or the industrial use i mean uh, the property usage or okay. the okay ek question hai mera sir ki ye apna india ka total energy use ka roughly what percentage would be fulfilled by uh, oil you see uh, it will be around i think 40% 40% uh, maybe maximum is coal maximum is coal okay okay both are near i mean 40% maybe 35% probably like that so they are almost at par rest balance is rest of the balance is rest. okay uh, sir i have a question sir mm -hmm. uh sir uh, like uh, we have seen in the lockdown times uh, the oil uh, demand has dropped uh, drastically during yes. the lockdown period yes. so how is the supply chain uh, impacted like uh, uh, the imports were continuous during that time or they were also frozen and how uh, the storage were, was managed if the imports were continued it's a good question i would say because during the lockdown period we have a very difficult situation as a matter of fact if you remember there was a spurt in demand as far as lpg is concerned because everybody was at home yes cooking at home and all those things that activities were going on there was around 40% jump in the requirement of lpg and practically there was nil requirement of other fuels now in a refinery it cannot happen that you produce only lpg if you are doing that process refining process all the products will have to come out so it was a major problem and uh, i was in service at that point in time i retired only last month 30th of november so it was a big problem and problem was how to store that product which is coming out now lpg you can't stop because lpg in any case people require this and you can't stop you can't allow that any area of the country to go dry or backlog cannot be created beyond a particular limit so what we did was that the all retail outlets their storage tanks were made full all indian oil tanks were i am talking about only my company i was working there so all the tanks of indian oil they were made full at all the locations yes sir and there was some surplus product which could have been sent i mean exported that was exported particularly of naphtha because when you are producing naphtha naphtha can be converted into petrochemicals now because petrochemical conversion also has a capacity now whatever was available beyond that capacity probably was exported so that is how we could manage and from june onwards probably it started improving then our pain was lesser and lesser so we have almost reached now pre covid levels almost not fully uh, yes sir Uh, sir you uh, just uh, exported the oil which was uh, extra sir uh, the demand was also low globally so uh, like where uh, which country was ex exporting importing like 
uh, was there any uh, different scenario in different country no there was no different scenario because there is a different kind of uh, activities in each country like if you example you take example of myanmar myanmar is always short of product because it has no sports other than uh, the import so we could supply to countries like myanmar like bangladesh of course bangladesh doesn't require much myanmar then it uh, naphtha naphtha can be converted into petrochemicals so wherever the those plants were working in those countries that was exported to those countries particularly and it goes basically to countries like uh, uh, iraq also not iraq venezuela venezuela it goes the final product the final product goes to those countries but as far as our exports are concerned exports are basically limited to bangladesh myanmar sri lanka it is basically restricted to those areas thank you sir so it was a very major knee jerk for the supply chain you know it's it's a great uh, i would say planning to the it was a major work at that point in time uh, any more question uh, sir i am having uh, one more request uh, yes. some of our participants uh, are international participants Yes. so they may not be able to attend the session at present can we share uh, your lecture video on youtube thank you uh, love ha uh, you can okay sir uh, this you. this this uh, presentation no yes sir this presentation ah uh, you can so uh, on the behalf of jcbo university of science and technology uh, i am very much thankful to dr hars sasde for being uh, with us and taking out some time from his busy schedule and giving us such a valuable talk thank you sir for being with us thank you very much thank you very much it's my pleasure to be amongst such a august gathering and uh, i learned a lot in the process so thank, thank you. you so much all the participants and i will await my next session so that i can interact more thanks thanks a lot sir thank it was wonderful thank listening you. to you thank, thank you sir thank you thank you sir thank you sir thank you thank, thank you. you sir thank, thank you. you very much